and welcome to the works. I'm Ben Peltier. And I'm Ben Che. Pianist Ka Jung Wong came to our show a few weeks ago to give us a preview of this year's Music Lab Festival. The festival is still underway, but one of the highlights so far was a recent concert by pianist Gerald Chu. Gerald and his band will be with us later on the show to tell us more about his original music compositions. But first, movies. Some film directors like to use the same actors over and over again. This repeated actor-director dynamic can be seen in the work of such directors as Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, and Quentin Tarantino. Playwright and film director Martin McDonough recently reunited two actors with whom he'd last worked in 2008, and for him and for them, the old chemistry was still there. In March, McDonough was here to attend the Hong Kong International Film Festival. We went to talk to him. Among the filmmakers invited to this year's Hong Kong International Film Festival in March were the veteran Spanish director Victor Arisa and the British-Irish playwright and director Marty Madonna. The festival organized film programs featuring the work of the two directors as well as master classes. We're very happy to be able to invite some of the best and most anticipated filmmakers from all over the world to come to Hong Kong. Martin Madonna is a director that I admire very much. He came from a background of a stage director, but then he changed into film and then all the films, uh, he's, he wrote the script himself, and they are very dark tales, but very comical tales that show his ability in both script writing and directing. So he is one of the uh, best Hollywood directors at the moment, and I'm really honored to have him here in Hong Kong. Marty Madonna was born to Irish parents in Camberwell, London. That's where he grew up, but summer holidays in the Connemara region on the west coast of Ireland made a lasting impression on him and reinforcing his sense of his Irish heritage and his love for the environment. He began his career as a playwright, setting his first six stage plays in and around County Galway. His film career as a writer-director began in 2004 with the dark comedy short Sex Shooter. It received an Academy Award in 2006. In Bruges, his first full-length film in 2008 featured Colin Farrell and Brandon Gleeson as two Irish hitmen. In 2012, he wrote and directed Seven Psychopaths. And in 2017, three billboards outside Eben, Missouri. Madonna once again joined forces with Farrell and Gleason for his most recent work, The Banshees of Inisherin, which earned him nine Academy Award nominations. His works for both stage and screen are often characterized for their sharp dialogue, dark humor, and examination of violence. I, I, I like the plays, but I always had an eye on, on the movies, too. And I think I would have always been a, seen myself as a failure if I never tried to uh, make one, even one movie. Um, but I uh, grew up not being around the film business, and uh, I wouldn't know. And it's harder, I think, in, in England than other places to, to get a foot in the door of making a movie. So I did the plays for about tw 10 years or so, and at the end of that time, there was enough success to be able to say, I would like to both write a movie and to direct a movie. <laughs> Um, I think it's probably just the way I see the world. Uh, <laughs> I see I see the tragedy, I see a lot of tragedy, um, but I think sometimes it will make us too depressed if we just see the tragedy for what it is. So, so to, to, to make jokes or to try and see the funny side of things is how I naturally am as a person. So even in, 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 the, in the film stories, to, to apply that I think is, is interesting. But in one of your uh, previous uh, interviews with um, Taylor Swift, you mentioned that <laughs> you were uh, such a happy person, but you write uh, sad stuff. Yeah, I guess it kind of gets rid of the, the, <laughs> the sadness and the darkness. Yeah, I'm a very happy person, but I'm very lucky to, you know, to have even had the success with the plays and the movies. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just a happy, happy lad. <laughs> I 
wanted to explore sort of all breakups, be they um, platonic or, or sexual, but in, in the form of this thing between two guys, two friends. So it doesn't have the... You don't have to pick your side as a man or a woman in this breakup story. It's something stranger, but hopefully something where you can explore all breakups in, in, in this kind of almost silly um, reason for, for a breakup. I think it allowed me to, to explore real sadness uh, through a comedy lens, because it seems like a silly situation, two guys, two friends who, who, who come to this place. But in fact, any time a person is rejected for, for no reason or, or for seemingly no reason, it's, 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 it is a tragedy, really. It's, it's terribly heartbreaking. <laughs> Well, yeah, I never um, sort of do a treatment, and I never know where the story is going to, to go to. Um, so, so with each new scene, I'm as surprised as, as maybe the viewer is. And when Brendan came into the pub and said, I'm going to cut off my uh, fingers unless you stop talking to me, I was very surprised. <laughs> I thought, oh, this isn't, this isn't going to end well. Um, but I think there's something joyful uh, about being able to surprise yourself uh, as a writer. I've got to remember that more, to do that more often. If it's going well, I think you come to a stage where the, <clears throat> the characters are real, are their own people. They're not yours anymore. And so their decisions can be surprising. And I think to find that is really uh, exciting. <laughs> as if no time had passed between Bruges and Banshees. Um, strangely, they'd never made another film with anyone else in, in, the, in the interim, uh, and I was happy about that, because they're, <laughs> they're my team. Um, but they're just brilliant, and they're friends, and, and I definitely won't leave it another 14 years till the next time, <laughs> if I can. Well, I, in some ways, I think in Bruges, is a story about two men almost falling in love, even though they're hitmen. You know, they 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 start off kind of cranky with each other, but by the end they they love each other. Whereas uh, Banshees is the end of love. It's as if those people were married for fourteen years and then have to end it. So it's I almost see it like like a continuation of the story. What what happens when love dies? I guess. I was on a bus uh, or a coach going through America and I saw something on real billboards out the window that, that was almost exactly what I put on, on my billboards. And then the bus passed and I didn't even know if it was Texas or Florida or... And back in that day, it was pre-internet and there was no way to find out something like that. But the idea of that just stayed in my head, that someone would have so much pain that they would put something so awful on a, on a billboard. And just like the ones in my film, they were accusing the police of not doing enough. So then I kind of, in my imagination, thought if that was a mother um, putting something up about her daughter, how much rage must she have um, to, to do that? And that's how the story began. <laughs> Whenever I'm writing or directing, I just want to be as truthful to these people as possible because I see them as real people. But by the time the script is finished, they're real. They, they exist in, in, in my head anyway. And then I guess the secret is to make sure that the actors believe in them truthfully as well. And for me to be free, and me to let them go. And at that stage, the actor can take the truth as they see it. Um, I do like to... It's a combination of laziness and um, I do like the idea of just letting a story come to you and to not be under pressure of uh, the film business, not to try and follow a hit with a hit. The success, it shouldn't be really irrelevant... It shouldn't be relevant, I think. It should just be about... What's, how do you see the world with each new project 
and how can you tell a story uh, within that. Um, so so it's, it's, it's as much as just letting the ideas come to you and not being driven by the business. Are you doing what the Chrome characters does in the movie, thinking about what you would do in your art, in your remaining life? <laughs> um, I think I'm always thinking about what to leave behind, um, but hopefully there'll be lots <laughs> lots of, I hope this won't be the last one. There are lots of actors I want to get back together again, um, like Sam Rockwell and Christopher Walken. So I, I really want to do something with them. And maybe another thing, I like setting things on an island now, so I think the next thing might be an island, not in Ireland, but... Um, uh, and again, to have the island be a, a character. So I think um, that's a scoop for you. That's, I think, going to be the next thing. Welcome back. Pianist Ka Jeng Wong was here a few weeks ago to talk about a series of concerts that are part of this year's Music Lab Festival. Titled Original Excellence, the festival, which ends in July, features not only classical music, but also works in a variety of genres. One of the concerts in the festival so far featured jazz pianist Gerald Chu. Chu has studied music composition for film and television, jazz vocal performance, as well as the history and sociology of music. He's with us now. All right, Gerald Chu, welcome to the works. Thanks for having me. So let's start uh, from the very beginning. How did you get started with the piano and what made you sort of fall in love with music? I guess for me, it's, it's uh, music's always been a big part of the, the, the childhood, I guess. My, my parents played songs at home. And like many you know, kids who grew up in Hong Kong, I played the piano growing up. Uh, but not really much interest in pursuing music or like writing my own music or anything like that until I actually studied abroad. I studied abroad in the UK. And during that period, I guess I was exposed to firstly playing the guitar, actually. Oh, okay. And playing the guitar is, is very like, you know, you play chords, you play pop songs, that kind of thing. And when it's that kind of way of making music, that's sort of what inspired me to think, oh, it's not like the classical thing where I have to play whatever the thing tells me to play. Uh, and that sort of changed the whole mindset. And then suddenly one day I came home from, from, from school and told my parents, I want to be a, a musician. Right, and then uh, for, for, from that decision, saying you want to be a musician, then uh, how did that lead to sort of where you are now? I started working as a session player in the UK, actually, playing for different pop acts and, and, and singer-songwriters, that kind of thing. I did that for about two, three years, and that's where I learned a lot of the, the skill, I guess, the craft of playing with other musicians. Mm. Uh, during COVID, I, I came back to Hong Kong, uh, and during that time, people started being like, oh, this guy coming back from the UK, he's got a distinctive UK taste, style of things, and then they liked that. Only then was I sort of given an opportunity to uh, put together my own project. So let's yeah. talk about this project, Gerald yeah. and Friends. Uh, who, who are your friends? The friends do change, <laughs> uh, but it is a collective, and I guess at this point, like a kind of brand, the Gerald and Friends thing. Uh, it started off just being a free space jazz festival at West Kowloon. They invited me to to do my own set. And like many jazz people, they're expected to bring in like, ah, the Jiao Chu sextet, septet. But for us, it would have been an octet. And the Jiao Chu octet just wasn't really <laughs> hitting it for me. Uh, so I called it Gerald and Friends. In, in April, Gerald and Friends released uh, the debut album. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that album. As mentioned before, like that, that initial show was, was in 2020. One, mm. I think. So since then, we've been playing these songs in various venues around Hong Kong. <clears throat> not too often, but not, uh, keeping it going. And at some point, I just thought to myself, if I was to take this to the next kind of level, it's better to just lock it down, record it, and have something that people can come back to. And uh, recently as well, uh, as part of Music Lab Festival 2024, you had a show called Gerald and Friends House Party. Yeah. Uh, just tell us a bit about what went on in that show. So that one was kind of like a big culmination of these couple of years of like trying to put out my music. And I was lucky enough that the guys at Music Lab, uh, Joyce Jung, uh, uh, she mentioned to me like, oh, it would be great to involve you in this, in this festival. And so it was the first kind of like more official, had, had sponsors, had help basically, <laughs> had help behind me to put on a show. And, and yeah, it was great. Very nice. And we were talking earlier, you mentioned that the community aspect is an important thing for you in music. Can yeah. you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, for me, I think when I first came back to Hong Kong, but actually just in general, in, in, in when I've been pursuing music, jazz is often seen as a kind of like 
to some people, a little bit elitist, a little bit like hard to approach, and, and a lot of people listen to it and go like, ah, it's not for me, long solos, meh. Uh, for me, it was very important to, to bring sort of jazz back to the people and make it a more approachable art form, to then maybe go and listen to the deeper stuff that even I love too. <laughs> uh, but for me, I wanted to be like that bridge that right. represents, so the community spirit, the, uh, the fun, uh, the joy of making music is, is, is very important to me and is a message that I want to convey to the audience. So, Gerald, you're here today with uh, your friends as well, and you, you're all about to perform a song for us. What have you chosen to play? Uh, so the song I've picked is a song called Typhoon Number no. 7. Uh, it was written, actually, I say this in my shows, in honor of Free Space Jazz Festival 2023, which rather famously was rained off. <laughs> I was given a, a slot to play at Laubach like two months later, and I wanted to write a new song for that. So I came up with this title, Typhoon Number no. 7. It was from a melody that I created actually way when I was back in the UK, and it had this sort of like anger and, and catchy melody. For a while, this song was steeped in my mind, and I kind of like, I didn't really know how, to, how it ends, how it finishes. Mm. But eventually, I came up with this idea of like really breaking it all down and rebuilding, like a phoenix sort of rising from the ashes like overcoming a typhoon. So that's why the title, Typhoon Number no. 7, it's also a typhoon that doesn't exist. That's another reason why. <laughs> nice. Well, uh, thank you for coming in today, and I look forward to hearing Typhoon Number no. 7. Thank you.